All right, we are live and the floor is yours. Thank you for uh, attending. Um, everybody, this is uh, your regularly scheduled uh, January 5th um, Morro Bay Planning Commission meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum and I would like to call the meeting to order. Uh, first off, do we have any planning commissioner announcements? Seeing none. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I think Susan had something, maybe? Well, just a, a quickie. Um, I have heard that the Bay Theater is for sale. Um, so sort of putting it out there, hoping that there is someone who wants to continue a theater in Morro Bay. Um, she's selling the building, the business, the whole thing, but that it also brings up um, something maybe for us to discuss down the line is the historic properties preservation ordinance that I know Michael has done a lot of work on and the historic society and, and a, a good crew of people. So would love to see that come forward at some point. Very good, thank you for that. Um, okay, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll, I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah, you know, on that topic, I, on my walk today, I, I noticed that that house at uh, Kern and Ridgeway it's a kind of an iconic uh, New England house that I think a fairly renowned artist resident of Morro Bay lived in is for sale. And as I passed it, I was again thinking of the historic, historic preservation ordinance that we have and, and how that might apply to that, to that house. Very good, something to think about in the future for sure. Um, Okay, uh, that's it. We'll move on to uh, public comment. Uh, this item, uh, this part of the meeting is usually reserved for folks that uh, have items to discuss that are not on the agenda, or if they can't wait to uh, offer their uh, public comment during the normal comment period. AGP, do we have anybody in uh, the queue with their hand up? Currently, I do not see any hands raised in the queue. All right, we'll give it a couple seconds here. Going once, going twice. Okay, we'll move on. Um, so public participation, just a quick, uh, quick notice about public participation. If, you, um, if you're watching this on your, your cable channel 20, you're more than welcome to join this meeting by going to the agenda on the city's website and clicking on the webinar um, hyperlink or using the uh, telephone um, call-in method, and I won't go through all three of those numbers, but they are on the agenda. Um, please um, come give us your comments. We're here to serve you and want to hear what you have to say. So um, uh, that being said, we'll move on um, to presentations. Any presentations? So we'll uh, go to... I'm sorry, Scott. No, pre no presentations. No presentations? I didn't think we did. Uh, so item A, uh, consent calendar. Any comment on public uh, on the consent calendar, or do we have a motion? I'll move we approve the consent calendar. I'll second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, Scott? Second. Um, uh, who, who moved it? I didn't catch. Was it Susan? Michael moved, oh, and I Lucas. seconded. Uh, OK. Uh, Mr. Lucas? Aye. Commissioner Stewart. Aye. Commissioner Engrafia. Aye. Vice Chair Barone. Aye. Motion passes. Motion four passes four zero. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Wasn't sure. <laughs> Wasn't sure who line, whose line that was. <laughs> I, either of us can do it. I. Uh, you, you prefer it could be you. No problem. No, 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 not at all. Um, still trying to find my uh, my sea legs here. So. Okay, moving right along. Um, item B, public hearings. Um, Damaris or Scott? Yeah, we have uh, Damaris with our public works department. She's our in, uh, environmental programs manager and she'll be um, presenting the, uh, the appeal this evening. Um, Damaris? I will, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here. Just a second. And I think we got this. All right, everyone can see my screen? Mm -hmm. We can see it. 
Yes. Okay. Um, so good evening, Planning Commission, and uh, Happy New Year's. Um, tonight we have an appeal of an administrative tree removal permit. <clears throat> this removal is for four trees in the public right of way. They are located at 355 Cerrito Place. Um, the appellant is Betty Winholt, and the applicants are Josh and Christine Martin. So the director um, is authorized to deny or approve a tree removal pursuant to Morro Bay Municipal Code Section 12.8.70. Planning Commission's functions and duties are to uphold or deny the appeal, uh, remand the project back to staff for re-review, or continue to a date certain and provide direction. Uh, Morro Bay Municipal Code Section 12.8.70 reads, no tree shall be removed from the public right-of-way unless it interferes with the necessary improvements of the public right-of-way, the installation of public utilities, or as a hazard to person or property outside the drip line of the tree at maturity, or causes <clears throat> such a condition as to constitute a hazard, or an impediment to the progress or vision of anyone traveling on, <clears throat> on or within the public right-of-way. If in the opinion of the Director of the Public Services, the tree is determined to meet the above criteria, it is posted for a minimum of 10 days and all property owners and residents within 300 feet are notified of the scheduled removal. <clears throat> Um, so we did receive a um, administrative tree removal permit that was applied for on November 19th, 2020. Uh, the removal was for the replacement, uh, was for the removal and replacement of nine trees in the private property and five trees in the public right of way. The removal request was reviewed by staff and the trees were posted for removal on December 1st, 2020. An appeal was filed for four of the trees in the public right of way on December 10th, 2020. This is the existing site and aerial vision of it. Um, this is 355 Cerrito, it's near um, the corner of Cerrito and Shasta. Um, and then also a street view of it. Um, you can see the Monterey Cypress there underneath the uh, larger eucalyptus. So the removal request was um, submitted by the property owners. Um, they provided a reason for removal and a replanting plan. That was exhibit B in your staff report. They also submitted a arborist report. Um, that was exhibit C in your staff report. <clears throat> the report highlights the trees are growing in the understory of the dominant eucalyptus trees with foli fo foliage growing towards the houses. <clears throat> Uh, the trees are in poor shape and in, de in decline that cannot be reversed. Uh, the trees have no chance um, of accommodating actions that can be taken to bring them back to health or help them more structurally. <clears throat> A monarch, uh, monarch, monarch butterfly habitat assessment was also provided. That was Exhibit D. Um, the report states the removal of the Monterey Cypress will not impact the monarch overwintering habitat at Eagle Rock or Cerrito Peak. So this is a picture of the first three trees. So tree one and tree three are part of this appeal. Um, we'll start with tree one. Uh, you can see it uh, leans out more towards the street there and has a few branches in that first picture that you can see. Uh, the second picture kind of shows the back of it, which you can see it doesn't really have uh, any foliage or branches in the back of it or near the top. It's really hard to get pictures of the trees to really highlight some of the issues with it. So hopefully um, people have had a chance to visit the site. Then <clears throat> um, you can also see the third tree. Um, there are a few branches and again, they're all on the side of the house and the driveway there. This is trees four and five. Uh, tree four is a very small eucalypt or uh, Monterey Cypress. Um, it, it actually barely meets the definition of a tree, which is six inches at diameter at breast height. Uh, it only has a couple of branches and the top of it um, appears to be dying or dead. Uh, then you have the fifth tree, um, <clears throat> which has a few more branches, again, all on one side of it. And the second picture there is trying to show that a lot of those branches are just really intertangled inside that eucalyptus grove there. So the appeal issues. Um, first one, it basically restates the, the code requirement that I just read. Um, it says none of these trees are being requested for removal due to interference with necessary improvements, utilities, or visually blocking the travel in the right of way. 
<clears throat> staff's response states that the blue gum eucalyptus dominate the overhead um, canopy. The smaller, weaker Monterey cypress are stretching to reach the sun. So only the live branches are headed towards the house, putting the weight of the tree towards the house. <clears throat> this is very unstable situation where wind throw can cause injury, damage, or death. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the reason for removal meets the removal requirements in Morro Bay Municipal Code section 12.8.70 due to the trees being a hazard to person or property outside the drip line of the canopy. Appeal issue two, are the public trees hazardous? The Arborist report paid by the applicant implies that they are. This implies because the, Arborist, because the report refers to uh, the 14 trees as a group. The report does not separate private trees from public trees. The report does not evaluate these trees individually. Staff's response says, all the trees were planted by the previous owner as a group for screening purposes. They were all planted at the same time and along the property line. Many people unwillingly plant, unknowingly plant in the right of way, assuming their property line goes to the street. Now these trees were planted as private trees, or all of those trees were planted as private trees. None of them were planted as public trees. They are only regulated as public trees now due to the location of the right of way. It would not make sense to have a separate arbitrage report for the public trees and the private trees. They're all the same. The trees only have foliage on one side of them, the house side, and with little to no foliage on the top and where the eucalyptus trees are. Appeal issue number three, um, to add confidence to the characteristics of Monterey Cypress, there's a description from Cal Poly's Urban Forest Ecosystem Institute. USDA hardness zone seven to 10, exposure full sun to partial shade. Moist to dry soil, drought tolerant, and branch strength rated as strong. So Steph's response, <clears throat> while the Monterey Cypress can survive in full sun to partial shade, these trees are growing in the canopy of the dominant eucalyptus trees. The Monterey Cypress are not thriving in the understory of these taller trees. This is evident in the fact that there's no, no to little foliage on the tops and the sides of the trees near the eucalyptus trees. There are also no foliage on the trees. <clears throat> only, the only foliage on the trees is near the house side um, where there is no eucalyptus trees. Appeal issue number four. Um, from Mora Bay's Urban Forest Management Plan, we learned that these particular trees are 24 to 30 years old. We also learned that these trees address climate change by sequestering 21,924 pounds per year, runoff interception of 39,870 gallons per year. And then there's a picture of the new replacement trees, um, which don't come close to sequestering and performing runoff interception. So the staff's response, the trees <clears throat> were not evaluated as part of the urban forest management plan. The only trees surveyed as part of this plan are part of this evaluation where the downtown and business areas, not the residential areas. This section of the urban forest management plan is referring to a program called iTree. And that program um, take, provides information about specific trees potential to address climate change and intercept runoff. If these trees are 24 to 30 years old, they are very small Monterey Cypress, potentially due to the fact of their location under the eucalyptus trees and therefore not likely to provide the benefits of a full grown Monterey Cypress could provide. The city does, however, understand the value of a full size tree compared to a newly planted tree, but unfortunately these Monterey Cypress are just planted in a location that they cannot survive. So the appeal request um, really for action is unless the four public trees are identified, evaluated, and found hazardous, the criteria for their removal has not been met. They should be allowed to remain as public trees <clears throat> that everyone who enters Cerrito Peak from Shasta Street enjoys. Staff's response is um, the applicant did provide an arbor support highlighting the trees decline that cannot be reversed and potentially with wind throw hazards. Additionally, the arborist report states that there is no chance that any accommodating actions can be taken to bring them back to health or help them structurally. Also, the applicant does have plans to replace the trees. Therefore, staff's recommendation is to deny the appeal and uphold the director's approval of case number TRE 20-183, removal of four trees in the public right-of-way 
at 355 Cerrito Lane and adopting planning commission resolution 01-21. Um, so that concludes it and I have questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Damaris. Uh, Michael? Yeah, uh, thanks, Damaris. I really appreciate uh, staff's got a, a tough job on this one. Can you tell me what the replacement trees are and what the nature of those trees are relative to the scale that they will grow? They're silver sheen, silver sheen pittosporum. Um, they, I think you can see in that picture there right now, they, they're probably like a 15 gallon, just little bushy looking. Um, they, they can get fairly tall. We have a couple of them in the back of our um, uh, office right now that are as tall as a two story building. Um, and they've, they've, you can trim them as a bush or trim them as a tree. They're kind of versatile like that. They do have little bitty tiny silver shine leaves on them. So the, by your estimation, it's a 16 to 20 foot tall tree. Um, the ones in our back are, yeah, they're they're two they're two story tall right now. And do we just so I'm very clear, um, the original request was to take down 14 trees. The original request was remove um, nine trees on private property, five trees in the public right of way, but four trees in the public right of way is what the appeal is for. Okay. I just want to be very clear about we're only the the appeals are only the ones in the public side. Sure. There had to be a, a a request like this because they exceeded the number that you're allowed to take down by by right without a permit. Um, and the yeah, all of them were up for an appeal, but only these four were appealed. So they were all posted together. All fourteen of them were posted together. Um, and these four were appealed. Okay. Okay. The, the, the policy allows for removal of um, true, two trees per year on private property. Um, the appeal trees are not on private property, so the, that policy, that portion of the policy, would not apply because they're in the right of way. Joe, uh, Susan, Susan. Yeah, I wondered. Um, did they hire the arborist because they were concerned about the trees or because they wanted to be able to take them down or, or they knew it was part of getting the permit to take them down? Uh, I believe they hired the arborist um, because they were concerned of the trees. Okay. Um, yeah, the applicant is here and we'll speak. You can ask him that and speak on that. And the arborist is here as well. Um, that is going to speak to. So. Okay. And do we know that the pittosporum can survive under eucalyptus? Uh, these aren't actually planted right under, underneath them. Um, they're not like directly underneath them like the other ones are. Um, so I, I believe they would be fine where they are. I myself am not an arborist, um, so. <laughs> okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Joe, did you have any questions? No, no I have a question of the arborist, but no, not now. Okay. I just have one question, Damaris. Um, so the 14 are coming down. So the other nine, or the other, yeah, nine, 10, however many, <laughs> are staying, are coming down also, but just not under appeal, right? Correct. Okay. So 10 of them are going, going down. They're not under appeal. It's just these four. Okay. That's all the questions I have. So uh, we'll close the question um, process for here, and we'll move on to. Uh, the applicant, is the applicant available? I'm sorry, the appellant? Yeah, Bet Betty's in the uh, queue. KGP, if we can get uh, Betty at your convenience. Uh, let me go ahead and get Betty, Betty Winholtz. We're gonna be making her, uh, bringing her up. Okay, Betty, you are live and free to give, uh, free to speak, go ahead. I would like to be visible if that's possible. I have a presentation I'd like to, to give, a visual presentation. AGP, is that possible? She, she, can, um, she can share her screen. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Um, I think you have to let me on first before you can see my screen. 
I would have to promote you to panelists, most likely, to have you share your screen. Mm -hmm. uh, That's fine. Okay, Betty, you are now a panelist. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. Can you see that? Nothing yet. Um, can you see it now? We can see you. We can see yes. you. Okay. Can you now see my screen? Uh, not yet. <laughs> no. Okay. I think that, let's see. Hmm. Betty, do you have the little green button? Oh, oh shit. I think we, we got, I think we got something going. There we go. Okay. Can there we, we go. see that now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, good. you're good, Thank Betty. You. <clears throat> okay. I assume I have 10 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. At the beginning of my written appeal, I noted that there are a total of 14 trees petitioned to be cut down. Nine line the border of the private property and five are an extension of that row into the public right of way. I was told that I would have to pay $275 twice, once for the nine private trees as major vegetation and another $275 for the five public trees. Yet I would be afforded only one hearing. I had to make a choice due to the prohibitive cost so I chose the public trees. Curiously, the homeowner paid for one evaluation for the whole row of trees. The one evaluation represents all 14 trees, not distinguishing that the trees on the west end, the private trees, have grown differently and have different characteristics from the trees on the east end or the public trees. So if you visited the site, you saw that. Since it is a death sentence, um, each individual public tree should, in my opinion, get its own evaluation as it would at any other location or at the least, the east trees should be separately evaluated from the west. I'd like to make a few points. The first is, regardless of who planted the trees, five are on city property and accepted by the city as public trees. Mr. Holman, who planted them 30 years ago, and the city took ownership 15 years ago when a citywide survey was done to identify and tag which trees the city would claim as public. This hearing is the commission's opportunity and I believe responsibility to evaluate and protect these designated trees as a public resource. They belong to all of us, not just the adjacent property owner, just as downtown trees do not belong to the business owners. When a piece of property is purchased, the right of way remains the public's purview. The city has made various attempts over time to regulate residential right of way. It's possible the new owners were not made aware of what trees were theirs and which ones were on the um, private property. Uh, uh, but as we know, ignorance has not changed the law, so the cutting down of the nine private trees is now a given because uh, I, I could not appeal those. However, the five public trees and actually four are different and they need to be considered for the benefit of all. And this is looking at the, um, tr at the tree row um, standing in the east looking west. And you can see the lush greenness of the um, cypress there in the front. Point two, one of the requirements in the city's tree ordinance is that removing public trees does not affect the character of the area. I disagree with the staff report statement that the tree removal will not affect the character of the surrounding neighborhood. The reason given in the staff report is that replacement trees are proposed and existing mature eucalyptus trees are to remain. You can't remove 14 trees and not make a visual impact to an area. Since the replacement trees have already been planted, you can see that they are of a different character. They are vegetation which will never be trees of stature in which mature, uh, of maturity, uh, which hawks and owls, the birds of this area will use. If this this is the look the homeowner wants, that's fine, but their desired landscaping should not impact or require the removal of public trees. If my appeal is unsuccessful, the grove of 20 trees, 
the six eucalyptus and the 14 cypress will be reduced to one third of its current size. If the peel is successful, the stand of trees will still be reduced by a half. Such a drastic removal has to change the character of the area. The neighbor across the street from this property, whose picture is here below, has been removing and topping trees for several years, leaving the streetscape harsh and barren and uncharacteristic of this area. Even just a couple of years ago, the blue sky you see in this picture was all green foliage, but it's been removed on private property. Please remember that this is a special place. It is the entrance to Cerrito Peak. Just as the residents fought to maintain the integrity of Ridgeway entrance to Black Hill a few years ago, and the Planning Commission agreed, there is precedence for you to again maintain the character of this entrance street. Point three, I believe the city will be losing some control. Replacement is required and they have been replaced on private property. The replacement survivability now though becomes the choice of the property owner. The replacement trees have not been required to be of like kind and this, uh, the city is relinquishing these five mature trees which I believe are just stunted and not diseased. Their replacements will not be under city control because they're not being planted in the right of way. Number four, what is at stake here is more than just the removal of mature public trees. It is a loss of their function. The Morro Bay Urban Forest Management Plan, and this was gone over by Damaris earlier, so I won't read it again. Um, five years ago, when this document was adopted, the public and the city were beginning to understand we have a role to play in climate change, or some call it today, climate crisis. As a coastal community, we should be under understand better than others the impact of cutting a tree. That is for every tree cut down, the ocean must absorb that CO2 that the tree is sequestering. As a commission, you can address climate change in a very real way, even if it is only one tree at a time. Point four, um, hazard is a primary reason for cutting public trees. I acknowledge in my appeal that the public trees are shorter than the eucalyptus. That doesn't make them diseased or dangerous. Picture the most famous cypress on the coast of the Monterey Peninsula. You've probably seen it in person. Um, it's asymmetrical. It's deformed due to the weather that it endures off the ocean, yet it has stood hardy for decades. I spoke to a licensed arborist in the county. He said there is no such thing as was reported in the arborist report, a cypress decline disease. There is a cypress canker that affects cypress trees, but that's only if they don't live near the coast. So number six, the planning commission relies on testimony from consultants, experts, and arborists all the time. But these are paid for by the applicant who wants a particular outcome. The commission recognized this when the developer of the Panorama Project hired the environmental oversight expert. You made it a condition that the city pay the expert with the developer's money to maintain some degree of oversight, of separation, and objectivity. I have asked for years that an independent arborists be hired to evaluate the condition of public trees when they are proposed for removal rather than receive the evaluation of an arborist who is obligated to the owner developer. One and a half years ago, the arborist hired by this particular applicant was hired by the HOA to render an opinion that would remove 10 city trees along Main Street because the HOA wanted to re-landscape the public right-of-way. When the item came before the Planning Commission, you allowed for a second opinion. Before that second op opinion came back to you, the HOA dropped its request. However, the city picked up the removal request. Once the second opinion opinion was completed and given to the city, the city stopped its pursuit of the tree removal as well. They didn't even return to the commission with the evidence. If you drive down South Main Street now, you can see the re-landscaping going around going on around these healthy trees. I believe the arborist report for this project is just as questionable. It was a group evaluation not focused on the public trees and not for the individual trees. Finally, I object to the pay to play idea that seems to be creeping into what happened to our public trees in 2020. 
so oddly in municipal code 122870 it says that if there's no appeal the city pays for the removal of a tree but in the two sections later in um 2890, it says that if there's an appeal, the applicant will pay for the removal. Now, this applicant was willing to pay to have all 14 trees removed before it was appealed. Well, I believe he and others before him have made this goodwill offer because the city is strapped for money. The idea that if a private party can afford and is willing to pay to have a public tree trimmed a certain way or even cut down, permission was granted. Taking advantage of public trees for private benefit is on the rise. I registered four separate complaints with the city last year. Looking at this bigger picture, what the planning commission could do is to amend section 1208 and pass their recommendation onto the city council for adoption. What would that amendment be? Applicants would pay their ar for their arborist reports to the city and as city would hire a neutral or unobligated sort arborist to make that evaluation. This would allow the city to be confident that the well-being of the tree for the public benefit comes first. In closing, I want to wax philosophical and scientific for a moment. If you haven't already, as decision makers, both commissioners and staff owe it to their respective responsibilities to read the books The Overstory by Richard Powers and The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wollenden. Unlike the pines we have seen blown over in storms and the eucalyptus who drop branches, the cypress is a very hardy tree. They were planted as a buffer between the Holman's home and the eucalyptus. As all trees who grow in groups, their roots are intertwined and they support each other. My guess is that the arborist did not tell the homeowner that the tree, uh, the trees benefit as either a buffer from the eucalyptus or the wind that comes up that hill. Unless the four public trees are individually evaluated and therefore found hazardous, the criteria for removing them has not been met. Until that happens, they should remain as public trees that everyone who enters Cerrito Peak from Shasta gets to enjoy. And if I have remaining minutes, which I believe I do, I would like to reserve them for a rebuttal. Um, and before I give up my time for a minute, um, I appreciate that the, Mr. Martin took pictures of the aerial um, showing how his trees are distant from the peak. But if you look back at that picture, you'll see that there is a continuous canopy from these trees up the hill. And that's what birds see, and that's who uses these trees are the birds. Um, I would also um, remind you that um, the Cypress um, may wind throw, but they are not trees that fall down readily, just as uh, we know the picture of the cypress along the ocean. Um, even up here at North Point, uh, that's been true. Um, and then the comment about the urban management plan, these particular trees are actually listed in that plan on those particular pages as I quoted in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. I'm not 100% uh, sure we'll have time for a rebuttal from you, but we'll uh, we'll hear the applicant. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, the applicant of the tree removal permit uh, now if they're available. Betty, can you stop sharing your screen? Um, do you know how I do that? Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Betty. Thank You're you. You're welcome. All right, if we have the applicant uh, in the queue. We have, uh, yeah, we have Josh Martin, his hands raised. All right, Josh, I have unmuted you, and you are go ahead and free to speak, please. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, first off, thank you guys. Uh, thank, I just want to thank the Planning Commission for hearing us out today. Thanks, uh, Damaris and... Um, and Cynthia as well for diligently working on this. And thank you, Betty. I, you know, Betty came to my house um, and told me she was she was appealing, and uh, and I did thank her. I, I do think that that uh, people like Betty are important to the community. Um, so, first off, my name is Josh Martin. My wife's not able to be here. Where we are, um, both my wife and I are critical care nurses at French. We've been here several years. Um, 
we have two daughters. Uh, one is a year and a half and one is nine. Uh, one goes to Del Mar and one, one goes to Village in Osos. We, um, we sold our home in, in the Harbor Track uh, in the beginning of COVID and we had the opportunity to, to purchase this house as severe disrepair. Uh, I don't know if any, any of you have seen it, but, but uh, we've come quite a long way. After we, we, we knew at, at first sight that the, uh, that the trees were bad and, and immediately, uh, first off, at, at first look, they glance, they, they don't appear to be safe. Uh, it took us about, I'd say, you know, four to five months um, of remodeling the inside until we were able to address the outside. First thing we did was we contacted uh, Greenvale um, and they put us in touch with their arborist. Um, and we got the arborist report, which uh, uh, Chris Steer is is here to speak to that. A um, couple of things I wanted uh, to address first as well to some of the correspondence uh, that we received yesterday. Uh, and I just wanted to speak to one thing Betty had mentioned. Um, I know that there was some correspondence from the... Um, uh, Salinan tribe, uh, and I, th I think that um, I did include a picture. I, I sent a picture to Scott. Is it possible to to pull that up? Scott, you with us? I am. Just give me a second. I need to find. I need to go find the uh, email. Bro. Josh, you want to continue while Scott's doing that? Sure, sure. Um, so there, there was correspondence. There was there was uh, uh, some concern from the Salinan tribe about the, the location. So in this picture that, that Scott's going to pull up, I, I I did take this uh, this snapshot this morning. Identified where the uh, trees one through five are um, in relation to the uh, the trailhead at. Um, for Eagle Rock, uh, which is 115 feet. So you can see tree number one there on the left. I stood about 10 feet lateral um, in the middle of the road. And um, so you can see where that next is. I measured it's 115 feet to the sign and 95 feet to the end of the right of way. Um, and I did just want to address that because I know there was uh, that uh, the Salinan tribe, uh, the, the spokesperson, did have a concern. Um, I also wanted to speak to, um, uh, I know Sean Green had, had emailed in. His concern was, was that this is a tree city, um, you know, tree city USA. Um, I'm glad we live in a tree city USA. Uh, I think that's all well and good. However, it, it doesn't, uh, it simply doesn't have anything to do with this case being as how these are unhealthy um, and more importantly, unsafe. Uh, trees. Um, and another thing, Betty, in her, uh, her response, uh, she had mentioned that uh, we were not going to address the uh, retaining wall, um, which, you know, I don't, I'm not sure whether I, I, um, I stated that to her or not. If I did, I misspoke. We, we do plan on repairing, either repairing the garden wall or, or putting up a new one, um, you know, after post removal, um, as to, uh, as to the trees, um, you know, I'm not an expert. Um, you know, we initially got the, the arborist report from, um, and I'm done with this slide. If you guys wanted to, uh, we did get the arborist report and, and, you know, I spoke with, uh, with Chris Steer, um, and he is present about Betty's concerns. I know that he did come out um, to uh, kind of address each tree uh, to alleviate any concerns. Um, uh, I also submitted a, um, a, a kind of a planting design that I think you guys can see. Um, we did so that the the ones that are planted um, were silver sheen. So it's basically I think one 15 gallon 
per tree or two five gallons. So we planted 14 five gallons um, and we plan on, you know, uh, a variety. I'm not sure, you know, uh, exactly which trees. I know we're planting some more silver sheen. I know that uh, we're probably going to plant um, uh, some strawberry trees, um, but it, it'll, it'll be well above um, uh, what's required. Um, so I submitted that design so you guys can take a look at that. That'll be done by IGL pavers, um, you know, once, uh, once we get started. Um, but, you know, like I said, as to the trees, um, you know, that's, that's about all I have. I just want to thank you guys for, you know, thank you for, for hearing me out here. And I'd like to, um, uh, you know, hear from Chris Steer, um, so that he can speak about those trees. Sure, Josh, uh, no problem. Um, we can get Chris um, able to speak. That'd be yes. Yeah, so let me go ahead and uh, bring him up. Hello. All right, Hello, Chris, Chris, you are unmuted. Okay. You are live. Go ahead. So let me just uh, just briefly present what I see. Um, the main issue here really is the shade of the eucalyptus. I'm sorry, Chris, I'm going to interrupt you just for a moment. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Are you the arborist? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. The arborist for Greenvale Tree. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please go ahead. So the, the main issue is the eucalyptus. One is a shade, which is causing these um, Monterey cypress to be one-sided or to lean because they are going to grow towards the light. There isn't enough light, and that's why they're weak. Um, the second thing is when we think about a eucalyptus, we realize very quickly, if you've been around them, um, that they're very aggressive rooters much more aggressive than the Monterey Cypress. Monterey Cypress, if we were to pull out a very good specimen of Monterey Cypress at full maturity and somehow look at where those roots are, they're in the top 16 inches of soil. So when you put a tree like that directly under a eucalyptus, you have competition that that Monterey Cypress will never it, it just it just is going to fail. And um, as these things lean and grow out towards the house, they get more and more leveraged. And these are not strong trees. I um, don't know if you folks remember, I'm gonna say about four years ago, we had uh, wind, we had rain, and they actually had to close Morro Bay High School and it was just the Monterey Cypresses that broke, and they broke all over. In fact, they fell on cars. They're not a strong tree. And like I say, as they become more and more leveraged with a shallow root system, they are going to tip over. They are going to break, period. And so that is, that is the hazard. Now, if you throw on top of that things like replacing a retaining wall, things like maybe extending a driveway, you've, you're cutting roots and you're going to make those trees even more unstable. And it's, it's as far as the health of them goes, um, none of them would be diseased. However, I did see red oozing sap, which is an indication of cankering diseases. And um, let me clear up one thing that's in the report because Betty mentioned it. There is a term called Cypress Decline Syndrome or Cypress Decline Complex, and I wrote it down as disease. And what it is, is especially since our drought, is that a complex of four cankering diseases, if we do pathological studies where we send in specimens, they come back with two, three of these diseases and, the, and they're hitting the trees because they're weak. So when I go to a situation like this where they're not irrigated, 
they're in a very shady area. I would expect there to either be those kind of symptoms or that it will eventually get it. It's it just, it's so prevalent on the coast. You can drive down Highway 1, look at the Monterey Cypress that's planted along there. You see a lot of dead single branches. That is the Monterey Cypress, or the Cypress decline. I think I could probably be more helpful if you folks have questions and I can answer the questions. Uh, very good. Uh, what we'll do is if you're uh, concluding your comments, we'll, we'll finish public comment. And if our um, commission has questions, we'll bring you back up. Is that okay? Sure. Very good. Um, okay. So um, we've finished the, uh, the applicant's comments. So we'll open the uh, open public comment. Is there anybody in the uh, queue there with their hands raised? Uh, yes, I do see a raised hand from Sean Green. I'm going to go ahead and unmute him. Okay, Sean, you are unmuted. All right, thank you, uh, thank Planning you. Commission. Um, first off, uh, I want to address uh, Betty's comments. So well said, so well researched, and, and they came from such a good place that I'm proud to have her uh, as a representative of our community. Um, and had I known that Betty was unable to include all 14 trees into her appeal, I certainly would have fi filed my own appeal for the remaining nine. Uh, next, I wanted to uh, address the applicant who actually mentioned something in my email specifically, so I feel honored. Um, he said that uh, Tree City USA has nothing to do with this case. And I actually think it has a lot more to do with this case than family status or occupations or the state of disrepair of the home, uh, though I certainly congratulate the purchase. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems like a very similar situation to what I did with my own house and, and fixing it up. And, and I'm, I'm a young person here in Morro Bay, so I think that's great anytime we have young families uh, that are doing that. Um, which then brings us to uh, uh, the appeal issue number two, uh, which I had uh, a little bit of an issue with uh, with the staff uh, response because um, basically the staff's position on two different uh, appeal issues was that uh, there was no need to provide an additional arborist report. And I think that that's really the core of the issue here, that there is no independence for these public trees. And so, in terms of advocacy for these public trees, which are on public land regardless of how they got there, um, we really need independence when making a decision like this, whether it's from our own tree committee or tree board or our own arborist, because um, you, you guys know as well as I do that, you know, if you want something done from a privately funded standpoint, you can get the report that says the thing, uh, you know, for the most part, and I'm not doubting anybody here, but, when we have trees that can't speak for themselves, there has to be some sort of independence and advocacy from the other side, just like as we would see from uh, a construction development where we have opposition and we have uh, the supporters speaking on behalf of the project. Um, so I, I guess that's what I'd, uh, what I'd like to say. Um, these trees uh, are going to outlive all of us, uh, just as the city of Morro Bay is going to hopefully live, outlive all of us. Uh, um, and so I just think we need to think, be thinking about the future just as much as we need to be thinking about this specific case. And I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Sean. I appreciate it. Uh, do we have anybody else in the uh, queue wishing to speak? I do not. Uh, actually, Betty Winholtz has raised her hand one more time. Let me go ahead and... Um, okay. Is it okay to use this time as rebuttal? You know, Betty, if you don't mind, what I'd like to do um, is ask, come back to the commission and see if we had questions for either you or for the uh, applicant, um, if that's okay. Yeah, I just wanted to correct two things, if you don't mind. Um, there are two leaning trees, one's public, one's private, and those are the only two. And just know that the retaining wall is only under the private trees, not under the public trees. And that the trees that fell at Morro Bay High School are very old trees, 80 to 90 years old, which is not like these young trees, which are 30 years old, and which I believe we're projecting onto them uh, their dis disease or disease in the future, but they're not at that point yet. Thank you. 
Very good, Betty. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we'll bring it back to the commission now. We'll close public comment. Um, does anybody from the commission have questions for either uh, Ms. Winthold's or Mr. Um, Martin? Um, Joe? Yeah, I would. I have a couple of questions for the arborists. Um, in fact, I would imagine um, that the arborists would conclude that at this point, there is no cankerous disease among the public cypress trees. That's, that's just like a definitive yes or no to that. And then I would also guess, I would guess that he that he can't offer any specific time frame as to when any or all of the public trees will fail and fall. So I, mean, I just want a confirmation of those assumptions. Mr. St oh, Mr. Steer? Am I on? Yes. Okay. So from the ground, I did, I did see no canker. I did see some of the red sap, which could be an indication. And without like pathology workup, I wouldn't know that. But the conditions are ideal for that type of thing because it's a very weak tree. As far as failure goes, that is really, it's kind of an, uh, or it's kind of in the ether. The, the thing to realize is that the bigger these get, if they get bigger, the hazard risk goes up because the weight is on one side, whether they're leaning or whether it's just the branches. And that puts a tremendous amount of leverage on a very weak tree. Yeah, it, it could fail in whole or it could fail in part. Okay, let uh, answer your question, Joe. Okay, uh, Michael or Susan, any questions? Okay, oh, Susan. Yeah, a um, couple of questions. One, um, one of the issues uh, that Patty Dunton brought up on behalf of the Salinan tribe has to do with ground disturbing activities. Um, assuming that you are cutting trees and even the ones on private property, um, what they usually ask for is some kind of monitoring so that if um, there are artifacts, human remains, so on, um, under the roots that they are there to record it and, and deal with it appropriately. So uh, will the tree company be, how, how are they going to deal with removing the roots? Are you, are you asking me or are you asking the applicant? It would be Chris Steer, I think. It, it okay. Would be. <laughs> it, as far as I know, we're not removing the trees. I'm just the arborist. If our company is, I'd be the wrong guy to ask that question to. Okay. I am the arborist and I just deal with um, kind of the health and structure of trees and that's it. Okay. So yeah, ask the applicant because that's a good question. But Yeah, or maybe even staff would know whether that's a requirement. Okay. Um, another question, I talked to a friend I have who um, has got a master's in landscape architecture, did OH, um, and the master's degree at Cal Poly. And I sent him the report and the pictures. And one of the things he noted was that the trees are planted at not only at a grade change, but also, again, some of them near this retaining wall that's failing. And he said, one of the things that's happening is that half the crown of the tree is buried and the side that it's buried um, is the side that's defoliated. And this happens because um, the root ball is it actually needs exposure to get oxygen um, and nutrients. And so that this half exposure um, is part of the reason for the die off um, in the crown. Um, he also, as you did, suggested that um, eucalyptus create a fairly hostile environment for almost anything else to grow um, in terms of taking up most of the moisture and and changing the soil acidity. Um, so it's it, it's not conducive to, to, I mean, you look under a eucalyptus 
grove and nothing else is growing um, except maybe eucalyptus. So I wonder if you could speak to the, the crown issue and the root exposure or lack of it that may be causing some damage. I doubt it. I, th I think what you're seeing is just issues of shade. Um, if the soil would be actually against the bark, then you could have potential uh, crown rot because that would not be good. But I, I believe the retaining wall was there before these were planted. And that way they would have acclimated to that. And about the eucalyptus being acidic and all that, Dr. James Downer has done a lot of studying with eucalyptus and eucalyptus mulch. And that, what he found, that it's just not true. You can use uh, eucalyptus mulch and there's no change in acidity from other, uh, other mulches. Um, the primary reason why we don't see things growing under eucalyptus is purely shade. It is, it's, it's a deep forest type tree and it, it will shade everything out, else out. I mean, you, you can walk in that eucalyptus. Well, you've all been in eucalyptus groves. You walk in midsummer at noon and it's, it's fairly dark. And that's that's the reason why this plant is not doing well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I don't have any questions for the applicant or the appellant. So we'll uh, we'll officially close public comment, and bring it back to the commission for for our comments. Uh, does anybody want to go first? Um, I'll, I'll go first. Okay, Joe. Uh, well, um, as a layman, uh, you know, the, the test is usually pretty simple for, for me. It's if there is an expert, in this case an, an arborist, who's saying that the conditions of all of the public trees, or most of them, represent a significant danger to property or life, then I, I think as city officials, we, we have to defer to that expert and do whatever we have to to protect property and life. However, you know, reading the report, it's interesting. Based on, on, on the points that Betty has made or documented, I, I think a reasonable person, you know, layman, could conclude that this, the conclusions of the report have some significant flaws. Um, what am I talking about? Um, the, the, the fact that the report doesn't really address each of the five public trees individually, but rather it sort of speaks in a collective tone. Uh, also, I, I note that only one of the trees is significantly tilting. Uh, I believe in, in, the, in, the res, in the response that the appellant made, there are some alternative explanations as to why there isn't uh, some significant growth um, uh, lowering the trees. Um, there's the issue of the retaining wall, at, at least for purposes of the report that I read, not being relevant to the condition of the trees, and yet it's made as a significant point as to why the trees should come down. Um, there is the, the, the mention of the fact that the uh, cypress uh, uh, what is it, uh, the, the particular disease of the tree, the cypress, uh, cypress decline disease, doesn't appear to be an actually recognized uh, tree disease. Um, and, um, and, and the effect that, and, and the notion that the removal of certainly all the trees and perhaps even the five trees are, would affect the, the, the character of the neighborhood. Anyway, so I, so I think a reasonable person could say, yeah, you know, I, I don't think these things have been sufficiently addressed. And I think in, in one of these sort of exceptional situations, we should have a second opinion. And I think that second opinion should be 
selected by city authorities and paid by city authorities. I don't think it, it should in any way be dependent on the resources of the appellant. And, and as to, to the appellant's comment early on that in, in, when dealing with public trees, the city should select an arborist and and uh, and, and, and do it in that approach. I, I wholeheartedly uh, embrace that. So I, I, my conclusion is, uh, and this is not to disparage the, the first uh, 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 report or the arborist, but my conclusion is that we should have a second opinion. Very good. Let's see, we get back to my, can't see anybody here. Michael, I think you had your hand up. Did you want to go next? Yeah, I think there's there's rights and there's there's expert opinions and there's um, you know what what should be done in a, in a larger picture and I, I think Mr. Green and Ms. Winholtz uh, hit upon something that a few weeks ago a few sessions ago when we looked at the the advance uh, report uh, during our consent agenda I, I, I pulled this project out and asked staff what was the nature of the the permit that was requested and. Um, I was kind of shocked that after we just went through years of battles with, with somebody who wanted to denude Cerrito Peak and uh, under another regime had a, a gift given them by the council of not having to go through a full environmental review that uh, it took years for that to get straightened out such that it, it went into the hands of a, of a caretaking third party now that will, that will take care of the um, that property uh, in the in the proper way, but but you know that's part of a much larger landscape up there. That all of these images are from very close, and I think if you walk farther away to the southeast or to the south, and and perhaps even out on the sea, I don't have a I haven't been out on my kayak to look out from the uh, from the bay, but uh, you know I, I think we're we're, we're we've got creep happening backwards you know the, the 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 kinds of loss of the treescape across the city are, are pretty dramatic um but when we start nibbling away at, at a at a real kind of forest urban forest up there we don't have the right policies in place so when things come up that have discretion i think we have to be especially careful with that and and i also appreciate Ms. winhold's depth that she went into to, to discuss this so for me, the, the thing comes down to, to three things. I, I don't think we should be removing trees unless it's absolutely necessary up there, especially in the public right-of-way. I think when public right-of-way trees are removed, they should be put back in a, in a public place, not, in, not into private property. And I think when they're replaced, they should be with something that's alike. I have, I have no confidence at all that the trees that were planted have any kind of the conditions or support the kind of wildlife or the or the environmental conditions that the ones that are lost would would help to to maintain. So I have, I have a big issue with with what's put back, where it's put back, when it's put back, and that that we seem to, uh, as Joe said, um, just look at one side of the issue when it's a when it's a professional judgment thing. It's not necessarily seen as a fact. So uh, I'm very mixed, uh, very mixed emotions about this. It's very dear to my heart. When when the Cerrito Peak thing came up, I did a lot of drawings that tried to explain how many trees the potential owner was was taking out, and and I was shocked that we didn't ask for more uh, evidence as to why this should be done. So I think when we're nibbling at the edge of that same asset to the city skyline. You know, we talk about the housing on the north side of town, on the, on the tank farms and things like that. And, and this is another city skyscape that, that is, is very unique. When you sit out and stand out at the rock and look at Cerrito Peak, or you look at uh, look at it from, from down in the flats there after you exit the state park, this is a very unique asset. I think we have to be very cautious when we allow uh, loss of, of that asset. Thank you, Michael. Very profound as always, Susan. I'm not sure I can be as profound as Michael. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing given that Morro Bay um, is really only a tree city because the people are here. Um, it did not have trees before we've created it. I think that's an excellent thing 
it's it's important and I and I do think you know having gone through our, our general plan and, and looking so much at environmental issues um, the importance of trees for for shade for warming for clean air um, is huge um, I do think looking at our replacement policies um, I think in some ways we're asking people to plant too many trees too close together, too fast growing that aren't necessarily going to be the appropriate trees. Um, if we're saying let's do a two to one replacement, I would love to see some of those replacements become public trees. So they're replaced in parks, they're replaced maybe in parking lots, they're replaced in the treescapes, there are the streetscapes um, where we need, uh, you know, those some of those trees are dying off and they need to be replaced. So rather than trying to overcrowd trees in an area that maybe can't sustain them, um, go ahead and, and spread them out to where they can be appreciated. Um, and it, this is a challenge. Um, you know, you, again, you have an expert saying these could potentially be damaging to this private property. Um, they may be too crowded. This guy who planted all these trees um, 30 years ago and then cut off the lower branches so he could get his trucks in, he may have started off this process of damaging them. Um, So, but whether they can be saved is, you know, a whole other issue. Would you have to prune the eucalyptus trees back to save the cypress trees? Could, could instead of pittosporum um, in, in such volume, could we have a couple of healthy cypress trees be planted a little further away so they get some more sunlight? Um, it, it's, this is, it's a tough issue. Um, you know, so, and then I also agree too with this idea that um, having to do two separate appeals for the public trees and the private trees is, and yet there was only one report that encompassed all the trees, that really didn't seem fair to me. Um, so I guess those are my comments for right now. Okay, very good. Uh, I, I agree with most of what you just said. Uh, matter of fact, I kind of stole my thunder there. I was going to say kind of the similar, a similar thing. Um, I didn't know what a silver sheen pitzoporum was, so I had to look it up, and it, it looks like a bush. And I'm not sure that that's, you know, even in the same ballpark as what's being removed there. And I agree that maybe, um, maybe we can consider... Um, Replacing them with a couple, of, you know, if we got three, which you know, not mature, you know, fifteen-gallon cypresses, in place of you know fourteen pitsoporums. I mean, the pitsoporums are going to get screening and basically, you know, um, help that homeowner out. But I mean, it doesn't really add anything to the character, as as we've been talking about. And in my opinion, I mean, the way way I'm looking at it, they're going to be low growing. You know, probably trim like a hedge. Uh, type of type of bush rather than you know a beautiful cypress tree, um, you know I. I um, so that's you know my opinion of that. The the whole thing about the arborist. I mean I, I don't want to disparage the arborist. I'm, I'm sure he's a very um, upstanding arborist, and it's it's not specifically his opinion. I have a problem with it's more of the process, uh, as Joe was talking about. Um, and I, I'm wondering if maybe we could talk about. You know, maybe getting three or four or five arborists um, signed up with the city, um, and you know, we just go in order. So next time, anytime anybody has an issue, we just take the next one in order of um, rather than you know allowing the the applicant or the appellant or whoever to hire their own because you know you kind of the pay to play thing. So that seems like a good idea. I mean, in in my my field, we have what are called special inspections, and those are all supposedly third party and you know administered by the jurisdiction and the jurisdiction has um you know oversight for you know anyway kind of off the subject but anyway there, there's a, a definite disconnect between the interested party and the person doing the analysis so um and i'm not saying that you know there was anything um foul going on here but it would it would definitely give 
more of a better taste in everybody's mouth if we had at least that uh, that it it looks like we're trying to be independent with the analysis. So anyway, that's my opinion on that. Um, I don't know if I had too much more. Everybody kind of covered everything very well. So um, I, I don't know. That's, those are my comments. Do we have a discussion, Joe? Yeah, I, I just I just want to reiterate, you know, I, I think logically bef before we were to address replacement trees or how many or where they should be planted, um, you know, we have to first come to the conclusion as to whether any of all of these trees should be removed. And, and the predicate for that is, do any of these trees represent an imminent danger to, to property or life? And um, that's the, the, very, the very basic question. And I think there's no way of, if, if other members of the commission agree that there are some reasonable flaws in the current report, I don't think there's any choice but to have another report that either confirms that there is a reasonable possibility of damage, danger to property or life, or there isn't. Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say that again. Yeah, Scott, if, if I could ask you a question here, or Demaris, whichever. Um, so the only. The only ones that are basically on the table are the four in the right of way, right? We can't even comment on the other 10 or 11 or however many. That's correct. The only thing that's in front of you this evening is the four trees that are under the appeal. And uh, the, the replanting is kind of a done deal? I mean, certainly you can speak to the replanting proposal for the four trees that are the subject of the appeal. Um, they are, that, that issue is raised in the appeal. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? Do we want to talk about it more? Do we want to have a motion? What do you, what do you guys think? I guess one thing I'm, I just wanted to point out is I, I think we have some remedies for some of these issues in the future documents that are that are coming forward for codification. You know, we, we did call for, you know, the ability to for the for the city to somehow identify a place where we could bank some significant larger trees. Um, that if it wasn't appropriate to do so on a private parcel, that, that we could ask people to contribute to, to something that was a larger reforestation effort within one of the parks. You know, I, I think of some of the eucalyptus in, in Del Mar Park and, and along the stream uh, uh, path there that, uh, you know, those are, those are places the city has done some, some replanting of some um, trees that I think will be larger at some point. And, and, and I, I think at some point we, we should have a, a policy that taking down a significant scale tree like, like some of these cypress um, can't be matched by something of that of the scale that was in this project but has to be matched by something that perhaps is a larger scale that goes somewhere else or perhaps the nonprofit could identify within the, the, the Eagle Rock area itself that they have control of where there might be potential places to, to replant um, some more significant sized trees because that is a unique habitat as was demonstrated by some of the studies that were done previously up there. And while this this in particular piece may not. I, I think that idea of banking things in appropriate places to to re, reiterate that intentionality about forestation as opposed to the kind of haphazard way that it happens now would, would be a strong thing, but it's not there yet. So I, I don't know how to remedy this situation with something that we don't have on the books. And and I don't know if it, we, we can't bank them for a future time when we have that. You know, that that's one of the concerns I have. Is some of the things I would propose for a remedy. I don't. I don't see necessarily having validity on the homeowner's property. Right. It would be tough to ask them to contribute to a fund that doesn't exist yet, um, or a, a program that doesn't exist yet. Right. Um, so my, you know, my opinion is, you know, the trees I saw that are, you know, in the public right of way are leaning. I mean, they they very. I don't say very obviously, but I mean very probably could fall. Um, so I mean, to me, that's. That's a very uh, valid safety concern. So, I mean, it would be hard for me to vote against the appeal or vote in favor of the appeal. It would, it would be very much my thought that I had to vote to deny the appeal, but that's just my thoughts. 
Anybody else? I guess I wanted to ask Joe, were you proposing some second opinion be sought and what was the mechanism that you, you might, might envision for having that done? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would suggest that uh, someone from the development office um, find a list of arborists, and select one and have that person come out and do a report that will tell us specifically each of the five trees uh, what kind of a risk it represents to, uh, to property and or life. Uh, essentially, you know, how likely are they to fall over and, and when, or, or if they are in fact diseased and the like. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm, I'm far from an expert on trees. Um, but frankly, they didn't look that bad to me and I don't want to address, as I said earlier, um, what we should do in the way of replacing these trees until I have definite understanding that the trees have got to be removed. Now, normally I would just defer to an expert's opinion, but I, I think as a layman, I can come to a reasonable conclusion that maybe these trees don't represent the kind of danger that we uh, might otherwise assume. Yeah, I think, uh, Scott, I think Joe's talking more about you know the the erosion of our faith in the reports we're receiving, and I, I kind of have to agree there. We had the same situation Betty brought up on the uh, the right of way trees, you know, year and a half ago or whatever she was talking about. It, it, you know, similar situation. So I mean, is there a um, is there a a program we could establish where you know the the applicants actually paying for the for the report, but the city's choosing the arborist? Could we do that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a policy that we have in place now. Currently, I mean, I see what I see what all of you see, though. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, that Main Street one, you know, uh, example that Betty raised is a good one, um, where we got a competing arborist report that said, hey, if you do X, Y, or Z, these trees will be fine, or less likely to fail. Um, so, I mean, I, I. I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, probably internally, we just need to take a look at what we're doing, and maybe that's what we go with. It's just understanding that anything that we take on, now we're doing the contracting for this, we're short-staffed, and it's more work for us. And so there, there is that component to all of this that, you know, I have, as it is now, always mindful of. Now, this isn't in my department. This isn't public works um, for the trees that are in the right-of-way. The same issue applies, though. I mean, we accepted the same report for the trees that were on private property. So um, that fact is not lost on me. Um, I do think it's, you know, worth looking at. Um, my biggest concern is the time that it takes um, to do that. Um, but, you know, as we brought up, I mean, we've had a couple of different instances where we've... Um, had issues raised related to the arborist reports that have come before this commission on, on appeal. And um, I think valid concerns were raised. Um, I don't think it's out of the question to have a peer review done on the report. I don't, I'm not sure about having the whole, the, the four trees that are the subject of the appeal reevaluated in their entirety. Um, certainly it would be very expensive. Um, um, a peer review, you know, as to whether the conclusions of that report from another arborist, you know, the other arborist finds to be valid, I think is probably more reasonable and um, would be less costly. Um, but I mean, it's it's kind of up to the commission. I mean, you can you can request what you want. Um, it's up to you. I would also note that at this point, um, going down the road of doing this doing the other reports is going to likely place us in a situation, um, you know, unless we can get it immediately, um, where they wouldn't be able to trim the trees for um, until after the bird nesting season, which starts in February. Okay. I mean, they'll be able to take out the trees that they have approval for. They just won't be able to take out the four in the right of way. Well, I mean, I think it definitely should be looked at the uh, the policy there, uh, and you know, if nothing else, maybe just a pre vetting of you know four or five or ten, however many they, they choose. The public works to maybe produce a list of, of certified arborists that that they um, that they are allowing reports from, and you know, hopefully that would alleviate some of the concerns of of if if the, another option doesn't um, take itself available. Maybe yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't disagree that you know now that we're seeing this issues come up, you know trying to come up more frequently, it probably behooves the city to go down the road of um, 
contracting for those services on our own and having the applicants pay for them. Um, we have the ability to do that, um, and I, I certainly see the value of it. Otherwise, we just keep ending up here. We might end up here anyway. Who knows? Um, um, but at least it'll be, have been the city that that um, you know is doing the reports, and, and it, then it alleviates the you know the scenario where they're just getting what they pay for. So. Okay. Well, as I hear it, guys, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, so we have a few options here. We could approve the appeal as it, is, as it stands. We could deny the appeal. We could condition for a peer review, or we could condition for another uh, full arborist report. I, th I think all of those are on the table. Um, did I miss any? Or So we could continue pending the, the receipt of an, of an arborist peer review? Correct. Um, I'll make a motion that we, we continue the project until we have received an arborist peer review and uh, ask staff if, if they can review the, the potential um, status of any locations for banking in the future. If, if I could, Michael, um, maybe expand on that. I wonder if we could uh, include in that motion to um, choose the the peer. What do you yeah, think? That's acceptable. I, I, I'm, I, I think it needs to be a third party, and I think it has to come from from staff or or somewhere some some point of staff expertise in in the city as opposed to external um, selection. Okay. We have a motion. Uh, so Joe, we have Joe raising his. Uh, yeah, so the the peer review would also include access to the applicant the applicants the appellant rather's um, report. Is that is that correct? So that they would see the countervailing arguments. Oh, I would assume. Yeah, they, they, they could get the full. They would have the full record. Okay, sure. Well, then I, I would certainly second that. Okay. Well, we have a motion and a second to. Uh, Who's the second? I'm sorry. Joe. Joe, Joe did second. you second? Oh, I'm sorry. Apologize for that. And that would be to uh, continue that to a, a time to be established by staff. Yeah, it's going to be predicated on us getting the report. We don't want to continue it to a date certain. We don't know what, if we'll have a report back or not. So. Okay, so it sounds like we have a motion and a second to uh, continue to a date uncertain to... Um, Before we take a vote, can I, can I pause right there for a second? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have both the person that wrote the staff report here, Damaris uh, and, uh, and Rob Leivik, uh, uh, you know, on the line. And I don't know if there's anything they'd want to add or concerns they might want to raise. I mean, I just kind of went out there and was like, yeah, we could do this, but um, <laughs> it's their department, so... <laughs> I, I'll just add that we have looked into um, an arborist that just does um, arborist report and doesn't do any sort of tree trimming, um, and that's all his business is. And I've suggested to use him before. It came down to financial reasons why we didn't. Um, so I think that this would be a perfect opportunity for something like that because he is a complete third party that is not obligated in any of this. Um, so, I mean, I think that's a, you know, a valid reason there. Okay. Thank you, Damaris. On the banking, um, just so I understand it correctly, you're talking, um, so because, for instance, in this one, um, I don't think it would make sense to plant Monterey Cypress back there again. So you're saying to bank them and so that we can, you know, plant them somewhere else within the city. Is that where we're getting at? Yeah, I think if you look at some of the discussion that went into the, the, especially the green part of the plan Mora Bay, you know, we have these continuing issues of uh, people wanting to cut trees for, for sometimes very legitimate reasons, other times aesthetic reasons. Um, and, and it's this, it's lament that, you know, we have this unique population of, of butterflies and things that come through that have taken advantage of these invasive things that people have planted with the, the eucalyptus forest that was here. And and so, you know, not trying to get it back to its in, indigenous nature of, of everything was gone here. Like, you know, Commissioner Stewart was saying, it, it's this idea of there could be places, and, and again, uh, Delmar is the one I, I always go back to, the park there, and, and we had the same kind of discussion about the, the nature of the replacing the cypress trees at some point around the high school. 
you know, when do we start trying to anticipate the loss of some of these things? And, and do we really want to lose that? And I don't think we do. You know, the, uh, we, have, we have unique species uh, traveling through here periodically that, that share this place with us. And it's, it would be a loss to see everything cut down um, just for an aesthetic appearance, I think. But I, 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 I wouldn't want to make, quote unquote, the owner plant a cypress tree in their front yard in, in lieu of what, what those ones that they chose are. I just lament that we lost, potentially are going to lose cypress trees as a trade-off for something that's, in my opinion, insignificant um, to replace that that impact they have. That's why it would be nice to have like gradations. Here's, here's a, you know, the, the trees we want to have around the entrance to the city, they're, they're an ornamental kind. Here's, here's a way that people, developers, private citizens who are taking down trees could, could bank something in a place that we want it to be intentionally. Or we're going to lose this tree here. Let's, let's bank one down in the, the new eucalyptus grove in Del Mar Park, if, if something like that would be appropriate. Or if, if you know, the, 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 the school district could come to terms with some of the properties they have where, where there might be cooperation or the state park. I think we talked about that before. The state park lost a tremendous number of trees, and it would be, I don't know what their efforts are, but that's a, that's a larger discussion with our, you know, kind of mini collaborators around here about, about something that's special to a lot of us, I think. And, and this is just one of those trip points that shows all the inadequacies of what we've got going right now. You know, one of the things that um, Sean Green suggested was pulling together some kind of a tree board or tree committee. Um, and I think that would be a great idea to just do a, a, a short term ad hoc committee to kind of throw some of these ideas together and, and really aggressively get some, some reasonable and smart tree planting going on in our community. Um, the, just a flat two to one replacement and you put in pittosporum, which is kind of a weed, doesn't really do the job. So I'd love to see that. I see Mr. Livick. Yes. <laughs> just want to add a couple of things to the discussion for your consideration. Uh, first, um, regarding the tree board, the city already has one in effect. It's the Public Works Advisory Board. So that was a combination of several boards years ago, and one of them was the tree board. Uh, cable Franchise Committee, Solid Waste Board were all combined into PWEB. So um, um, in effect, we, we do have a tree board. The other thing is um, um, the, really the only reason we're talking about these four trees is because somebody made a mistake and assumed that the right of way was their private property and planted trees. Likely we would have not have issued a permit to plant those trees in this location if we were to have been asked ahead of time. So um, many people plant trees in what they assume is their lawn, and because of we have wide right-of-ways that um, are undeveloped, um, lack of sidewalk and frontage improvements, um, these trees end up in the right-of-way and end up um, regulated and a lot of times maintained by the city when we never expected to maintain um, these trees. Um, in the in the right of way, um, so just add that um, for a little bit of thought. That um, um, likely, if we would have been asked permission to plant the cypress at these, this location, we would have either denied that request or recorded a covenant with the property owner saying, "Sure, but you're responsible completely for these trees." Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Rob, for waiting in. Thank you, Demaris, for your comments. Um, all right, Scott. So, I mean, if um, there's nothing else, what do you think? Should we call the roll call? I can call the question. All right. Everybody good? 
you can have more debate. I mean, no, I think we had a motion in a second to. Um, I forget exactly what we motioned and seconded. So we motioned and seconded to 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 continue to a date uncertain to have a peer review by a uh, arborist of the city's choosing. Uh, I'm assuming at the co at the uh, expense of the applicant. That's correct. Um, so um, yeah, if we can call the question, Commissioner Lucas. Aye. Commissioner Grafia. Aye. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Vice Chair Barone. Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you. Okay. Scroll back up here to the top. All right. So uh, moving on to item C new business. New business. Any. New business. No, no new business. Uh, any unfinished business? Nope. Sounds like maybe we ought to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, item E: Planning Commissioner comments future agenda items. So, um, Michael, do you want to bring up the agenda item of the uh, banking? Oh, I'm, I don't know if it. Uh, uh, my, my my mind at my age and <laughs> in, intensity of the last startup week at Poly. I don't remember where we were with those provisions inside the the plan more obey. I didn't I didn't look it up for today, but I I, I would I would just say based on the kinds of discussions we had tonight, those those things are very valuable. I think they're in there, but I don't I don't know how far they are in the action items or if there's any potential based on staffing capability to do them anytime once the documents put together, but as a long-term thing, I, I think it's a valuable thing to have in there. But I would be more interested hearing from, from Scott if 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 there, I mean, I could look at it before we have the next meeting but and, and potentially propose that, but that's something I would certainly want to make sure we study if it's not in the plan more day. I, I do recall the, the, um, having this discussion on um, numerous occasions, um, as it sounds like as you, uh, Commissioner Lucas. So, and I thought we had um, some policy, I thought we did have a policy in there to develop a banking system for trees, because we've had this conversation numerous times now. And certainly it was, you know, it was always something that you were interested in. Um, so, and other commissioners as well. So, my recollection is that we did put a policy in place, but I, um, I'm going to have to go verify that, which is something I'll do tomorrow morning. Um, uh, and I'll be able to report back to you at the next meeting um, about whether it's in there or not. And we'll certainly report back when we bring the item back, but I'll have the information for you at least for the next planning commission meeting, not before that. Perfect. Anybody else? Uh, planning commissioner comments? Feature agenda item, Susan? Wait, do we have applicants for commissioner? New, co new commissioner positions. I'd last like time I, the last time I looked at them, uh, I think we have uh, we had three. We might have we might have four, um, including including Jesse. Um, so uh, it either is just enough, or we have one extra. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, so we at least we have enough to cover it. Um, you know, if everything goes well in the interview process. So. <laughs> It's getting a little dicey there for a while, but uh, sort of at the eleventh hour, we got a couple of uh, last-minute uh, submittals, so that was good. Nobody wants to play with us. Come on. <laughs> I guess you guys. Maybe you guys are kind of scary. I don't know. It's <laughs> nice to be, but yeah. well, they're all five-zero votes. I mean, come on. We always agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, did you have anything? No, I really, I didn't. No. Okay, uh, just one bringing up. I mean, we already talked about it, uh, but I don't know. I don't think it needs to be a future agenda item. But the, yeah, that. So what I was thinking, Scott, was more like the special inspection, special inspection program that we have for building. Um, you know, if we can implement something like that for the tree arborist, uh, for the tree arborist, for the arborist thing, that seems like kind of the right thing. We, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in agreement. I, I think we probably this is now coming up, and you know more frequently and we probably need to do what we can to, so it doesn't come up um, at least that issue of it I mean I, I, I understand uh, you know that concern and, and we probably should do something to alleviate that I, I think that's worth an internal discussion on our part um, uh, 
we uh, we meet on Tuesdays for our development review team um, meetings. I'm probably going to raise it at that and see where we can, you know, if we can just make that an internal policy at a minimum. Um, I, I, if I'm on the planning side, I can't. So I, I'm, I'm just going to have, when it comes in, it's on private property. Um, we're just going to have them go through us, I think. I, there's no reason not to do it. Um, and I, uh, and I think at least it, we get a better report out of it that we don't have to question whether there's, you know, ulterior motives behind it or whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, and uh, just as a comment, I can see Betty's still here. So, Betty, I want to thank you for um, for filing the appeal. Um, definitely a discussion worth having, and uh, thank you. Uh, community developer uh, director comments. Ugh, getting late. Uh, I, I have uh, one thing for you. Uh, the next meeting, um, we don't really have any regular items on there, but I do have uh, a presentation from the county. Um, uh, on the uh, Moa Bay to Cayucas uh, bike connector. Um, Elizabeth Cavanaugh will be joining us uh, and giving the presentation. Um, it's to provide some opportunity for the public uh, to you know, speak to it and, and to hear what the project's about. Um, there might be other venues that they choose to you know, go to, but she had given me a holler and asked if you know, I need some place they could go. I said, well, you should come to our planning commission and present it to them. So um, you'll get to see that at the next meeting. Uh, it's no decision in front of you. Um, I'm going to put it on as a business item so you can talk about it all you want, uh, open it up for public comment, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, and hopefully we get some folks that are interested um, and it'll come in way in. So I'm um, looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, that'll be the only item on the, on the agenda. So giving you a little heads up, I guess. Outstanding. All right. Well, if that's it, uh, I guess we'll adjourn and seeing no hands adjourn to the uh, regularly scheduled planning commission, which will talk about the uh, more beta Cayucas connector on um, January 19th, 2021 at 6 PM via teleconference. Thanks everybody. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.